The alveolar partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide is important because this ultimately determines the systemic arterial pressure of those blood gases. So what determines alveolar PO2 and PCO2? First, let's talk about alveolar PO2. The alveolar partial pressure of oxygen is determined by two main parameters. One, you have the rate of alveolar ventilation, and two, the rate of oxygen consumption in the body, which is determined by the metabolic rate. In order to visualize how the alveolar ventilation and the rate of O2 consumption can determine the alveolar partial pressure of oxygen, you could think of the lungs as behaving as a bucket with a hole in it. The bucket is being filled with water from a spigot, which determines the rate at which water is entering the bucket, but because it has a hole, water is allowed to leave the bucket, and this represents the rate out. The water level in the bucket represents the partial pressure of oxygen in the lungs. So what ultimately determines the water level in our bucket is a function of what's the rate in, or the rate at which water is entering the bucket through our spigot, and what's the rate out? What's the rate at which water is leaving through this hole at the bottom of the bucket? As I said before, if the water level in the bucket represents the partial pressure of oxygen, then the rate in, the rate at which water is entering the bucket, this represents the rate of alveolar ventilation. Conversely, the rate at which oxygen is leaving our lungs, its rate out, is represented by the water leaving our bucket. Again, in terms of oxygen homeostasis, this is determined by the rate of metabolism, the rate at which we're consuming this oxygen due to metabolic processes, largely within the mitochondria. So we'll come back to this analogy in a moment. We can represent the relationship between alveolar ventilation and the partial pressure of oxygen graphically at various levels of oxygen consumption. So for this first graph, we're looking at the relationship between ventilation and PO2 at, at basal levels of O2 consumption. So this would be our resting rate of O2 consumption, somewhere in the neighborhood of 250 milliliters of O2 per minute. Notice that an alveolar ventilation of 5 liters per minute produces an alveolar PO2 of 100 millimeters of mercury. This falls within the relatively normal range of alveolar PO2 under most conditions. Notice that if you decrease the alveolar ventilation, reducing that rate in, that the alveolar PO2 falls. This is analogous to decreasing the rate of water entry into our bucket that's gonna cause the water level to drop in our bucket. Again, the water level representing the alveolar PO2. Conversely, beginning from five liters per minute, if you increase the rate of alveolar ventilation, this increases the alveolar PO2. Again, analogous to increasing the rate of water entry into our bucket, which would result in an increase in the water level in our bucket. Note that there is an upper limit for the partial pressure of oxygen, which is determined by the atmospheric partial pressure of oxygen. What happens to this relationship when the rate of oxygen consumption increases, in this case to 1,000 milliliters of O2 per minute, which would be representative of an increase in aerobic activity resulting in increased oxygen consumption. In order to appreciate these effects, let's imagine that you begin exercising, but you try to maintain that normal five liters per minute of alveolar ventilation. In this scenario, the rate of oxygen consumption would far outweigh the rate of oxygen intake, resulting in a dramatic drop in the alveolar partial pressure of oxygen. This is analogous to increasing the hole in our bucket, which would increase the rate at which water is able to escape our bucket, but by trying to maintain the same water level without adjusting the flow rate of water into the bucket. It's not gonna work, the water level is gonna drop. This extreme drop in the alveolar PO2 is incompatible with life. Our body tries to maintain an alveolar partial pressure of 100 millimeters of mercury, because again, this determines what ultimately is the systemic arterial partial pressure of oxygen. So in this scenario, with that increased rate of oxygen consumption, how do we get back to an alveolar PO2 of 100 millimeters mercury? Well, obviously this can be accomplished by increasing the rate of alveolar ventilation. So based on these values, if alveolar ventilation increases, this is accomplished by increasing respiratory rate and or tidal volume, then the alveolar partial pressure of oxygen can be brought back up 
towards 100 millimeters of mercury. For this scenario, this can be accomplished by increasing the alveolar ventilation to 20 liters per minute. So that's the determinants of the alveolar partial pressure of oxygen. What about the partial pressure for carbon dioxide? It's a similar relationship, but an inverse based on what is the source of carbon dioxide and how is carbon dioxide eliminated from our body. The two main determinants of alveolar PCO2 are one, the rate of alveolar ventilation, and two, the rate of CO2 production. Again, this can be modeled by our bucket with a hole in it, except for the parameters have flipped. Now, the rate in, the source of CO2 into our lungs is metabolic, and the rate out is via the alveolar ventilation. So again, if we look at the relationship between alveolar ventilation and alveolar PCO2 at a normal basal level of CO2 production, somewhere in the range of 200 milliliters of CO2 per minute, at an alveolar ventilation of 5 liters per minute, this produces an alveolar PCO2 of 40. And again, this is an important value. The body tries to maintain, under most conditions, an alveolar PCO2 of 40. This is particularly important because of CO2's role in pH homeostasis. Notice as, as the alveolar ventilation decreases, this produces a decrease in the rate out of the CO2, causing a dramatic increase in the alveolar PCO2. This would be analogous to plugging the hole in our bucket, but maintaining the same rate of water entry into our bucket, causing the PCO2 to climb. Conversely, if the alveolar ventilation increases from 5 liters per minute, the PCO2 drops because of the increase in the rate at which the CO2 is leaving our body, analogous to making the hole in our bucket larger. Again, this relationship can be appreciated by imagining what would happen if you increase the rate of CO2 production, say during moderate aerobic exercise, where CO2 production can increase from 200 milliliters of CO2 per minute to 800 milliliters of CO2 per minute. Again, imagine you do this, but then try to maintain a normal alveolar ventilation of 5 liters per minute. PCO2 becomes deleteriously high, but again, because the body tries to maintain an alveolar PCO2 of approximately 40 millimeters of mercury in most conditions, this can be accomplished by increasing the rate of alveolar ventilation. With this increased rate of CO2 production, alveolar PCO2 can be brought back down towards 40 millimeters of mercury by increasing the alveolar ventilation to 20 liters per minute in this scenario. So if you paid attention to these, to these values, it is interesting that under normal resting conditions, an alveolar ventilation of 5 liters per minute produces an alveolar PO2 of 100 millimeters of mercury and an alveolar PCO2 of 40 millimeters of mercury. Both values are approximately normal values under most conditions. And also it's interesting that when we looked at these scenarios where rate of oxygen consumption were to increase and the rate of CO2 production were to also increase, that these could be corrected for by increasing the alveolar ventilation to approximately 20 liters per minute, again based on these specific parameters. So under most cases, changes in alveolar ventilation can appropriately correct both CO2 and O2 partial pressures and do so simultaneously. There are interesting cases, however, where this is not true, where there's a mismatch between the blood gas demands of both O2 and CO2 that cannot be corrected for simultaneously by simply increasing or decreasing alveolar ventilation. In future videos, I'll look at a few of these examples and talk about how the body can make other changes, other compensatory changes to try to address that type of mismatch between alveolar ventilation and the homeostatic levels of carbon dioxide and oxygen.